Today we celebrate the Epiphany. Today is not Epiphany. Epiphany is actually January 6th or the 12th day of Christmas. But this is the Sunday closest to that, so we are celebrating today. And some of you are saying, okay, what is Epiphany? Epiphany is the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles, or Jesus being known as the Son of God through the visit of the wise men. And the traditional scripture for Epiphany is Matthew, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Hear these words from Matthew's Gospel. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. So most of you know something about the wise men, whether it's a vague recollection or it's tied up in the Luke 2 narrative of Jesus' birth. You know, the story that has angels and shepherds. But the story of the wise men is not in Luke 2. The story of the wise men is in Matthew 2. And there are no angels. There are no shepherds. In fact, they don't even mention Joseph. And the wise men, this story from all the history that we have learned, didn't happen at the birth. It happened up to two years after. The wise men, sometimes we've heard them called wise men, magi, magicians, astrologers, kings. We're really not sure who they were. We're not sure how many of them there were, but we think three because they brought three gifts. We're just really not sure. The one thing we do know about these wise men is that they came from the east, which means they were not Jews. Today we could spend our time talking about the various theories of the wise men, but what I really want us to focus on are the gifts that the wise men brought the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks that we are able to hear of the visit of the wise ones who risked everything to follow a star. Let us open our hearts and be willing to risk receiving the gift of gracious love that you have to offer us in the form of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the gifts, they're named in verse 11. Verse 11 says, On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. If the scripture can be bothered to record these gifts so carefully, there must be a reason why. If you know anything about Matthew's gospel, you know that Matthew was very deliberate 
about what he included. From very early times, the gifts the wise men brought have been seen as particularly fitting. Each gift has been seen as representing something which specifically matched some characteristic of Jesus and his work. These are not just individual gifts. They build on one another. And as we look at these gifts, I want us to think about the significance of them for us in 2016 and how we can honor Jesus in the same way that these gifts did. The first gift is gold. Most of us are familiar with gold. It's a precious, costly metal. Things like jewelry are made from it. Coins are pressed out of gold and used as money. Some of your electronic devices have gold in them. They, gold is used to make crowns for kings and queens. And we understand this gift of gold, a gift for a king, because we know about Jesus. We've studied Jesus' life, and we understand that he is king. Because we know of this life, we can easily see that connection. The wise men knew of God's promise, and they are acknowledging that not only was Jesus king at his birth, Jesus is king of us all and continues to reign over us even now. When a king rules, his subjects must be loyal and obedient. If Jesus is to be king of our lives, then the challenge is, what gold can we bring to Jesus today? What is it that we are loyal and obedient to that gets in the way of us being faithful to Jesus? What is it we can bring that offers that loyalty to God? Maybe it is a job that takes your time away from God and your family. Maybe it's all the things that you have, and here we are a week after Christmas, we have plenty of things. Maybe it's the events and activities we participate in that keep us from focusing on God and what we should be doing for God. If Jesus is our king, we must focus less on our wants and more on what Jesus wants from and for us. We must focus and pay attention to God and trust him. If Jesus is to be king of the church, he needs to be king of each of our lives. So what area of your lives do you still need to give over to Jesus? What are the things that you hold precious in your life that you have yet to give to God? What is the kingly possession you worship that keeps you from God? Because Jesus is king, we must be loyal and faithful, and we must honor him by spending time with him. And that second gift, the gift of frankincense. Frankincense, if you don't know, is an oil that was used in temple worship. It was burned as an offering to God, as a way to honor God. It is a gift of worship. This gift recognized the deity of Jesus. It recognized that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. With the gift of frankincense, the gift that is about worship and honor, we must think about the time we spend with God, the time we give to being loyal and obedient. How do we do this? Well, how is your prayer life? Are you taking time to study the Bible? Is worship, whether it is Sunday morning or Wednesday evening, is worship a priority for you? And not only that, when you are worshiping, are you giving your full attention to God? And here's a news flash for all of us, me included. Worship is not about us. It's not about whether we enjoy it or we have a good time. Worship is about glorifying God with our whole hearts, minds, bodies, and souls. And then, listening to what God is saying to us. God sacrifices his all for us. Do we sacrifice our all for God? 
And that leads to the third gift, myrrh. In Jesus' time, people used myrrh to embalm the dead. Now let's think about that. Who do you know that brings embalming fluid as a baby gift? (laughs) Myrrh was connected with death, and in this gift, myrrh signifies Jesus' death. If you look further at the story of Jesus, there are only two other occasions where myrrh is mentioned. It is mentioned as being mixed with wine and offered to Jesus as he hung on the cross. And then on that Easter morning when the women went to the tomb to anoint the body, they have with them myrrh. Myrrh is a gift of sacrifice. These wise men, in their wisdom, knew that Jesus was born to die. So when you think of the gift of myrrh brought by the wise men, you should also think about why Jesus came to earth, to die for the sins of the world. In the midst of all the joy and the hoopla of Christmas and New Year, this third gift reminds us that being a Christian is not always fun, and following Jesus is not always easy. Sacrifice and death are involved. We must die to our old selves, our fears and desires, and our self-centered lifestyles, and be willing to sacrifice our wants and our needs for God. Sacrifice means doing for others when we would rather help ourselves. I looked up in the Webster's Dictionary, and it defines sacrifice as the act of giving up something that you want to keep especially in order to get or do something else or help someone. To sacrifice means moving towards a risky, costly, Christ-centered discipleship. To live as a Christian is costly. It requires our time, our money, energy, friendships, and sometimes status. But when you're willing to sacrifice you can grow spiritually. Sacrifice is probably the hardest of these three gifts for all of us to offer because it does not focus on us. It focuses on God and serving others. Think about it. Think of the work we do as a church, the ministry we do. We couldn't do it without sacrifice. And without the sacrifice that God has made for us, there is no forgiveness. As I was thinking about the gifts the wise men brought, it reminded me of one of my favorite Christmas stories. I can't remember exactly the first time I heard it, but it was in elementary school. Some of you may remember, and I hope they still do this in school, Anne can tell me if they do, but after lunch, you would go back to the classroom. We were too old to take a nap. So the teacher would read a chapter or two out of a book to the class. That's where I learned some of my favorite books, things like How to Eat Fried Worms, Ramona and Beezus, and this story, The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. How many of you have read The Best Christmas Pageant Ever? If you haven't, I'm going to tell you, get it, read it. It's fabulous. There was a movie made back in the 80s. It's pretty good. Check it out. But I remember this story. And the story is about a church that's having a Christmas pageant, one like many of us have been a part of. My home church I grew up in did one every year. You know, the three, four, five-year-olds started as angels and animals. And then as you got a little bit older, you moved into being shepherds and then to wise men. And then finally, in fourth or fifth grade, one of the girls got to be Mary and one of the boys got to be Joseph. It was the typical church Christmas pageant. Well, this church was preparing for their pageant, and they were holding auditions, and this family found out about the auditions. Now, what the family knew about church was that church is where you got things. They knew nothing about Jesus. This family was the Herdmans. The Herdmans were dirty children, and when I say dirty, I mean they didn't bathe. Their skin was dirty. Their clothes were dirty. The Herdmans were mean. They beat up on other kids. They were bullies. They stole things. They caught, put things on fire. Department of Social Services had a file on the Herdmans. 
So the Hermans find out about the Christmas auditions, and they show up to be a part of the Christmas play. Throughout the auditions, they end up being Mary, Joseph, the angel of the Lord, and three of them are the wise men. These young children who knew nothing about Jesus come to the practices for the play, and they start asking questions. Why are we doing this? Who is Jesus? Why would we be, kneel down before him? And so they start learning about Jesus with these fresh ears that, wow, if we could all have again. And as they progress, they find out that Herod wanted to kill the baby Jesus. And so the three wise men decide, led by one of the herdmen's, whose name is the same as one of our pastors. I'm not going to tell you who, but it's not Rick or Dale. <laughs> he wants to go and beat up Herod. The director of the play convinces them that that's not what we need to do. We need to focus on the life of Jesus. But they truly get into the story of Jesus. And so as you read or you watch the movie, it's the day of the play, and they're producing this play. And Imogene Herdman is sitting there as Mary with tears running down her, eye, her face because she gets it. She understands that these people are offering themselves to Jesus. And then it comes time at the end of the play for the wise men to come forward and offer their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And one of the wise men is missing. Finally, Leroy comes running down the aisle and he kneels before the baby Jesus and offers up the Christmas ham. The ham his family received from welfare, the only food his family has for Christmas. And he offers it to baby Jesus. And he won't take it back because it's a gift and we don't take back gifts. You see, Leroy was making a sacrifice. He understood who Jesus was, and he was offering up what he had. Sacrifice. It means giving of something you really want for someone else. In order to be faithful followers, we must be willing to offer ourselves to God and follow where God leads. That means following obediently, even though we may not know where we are going, that means giving up control and allowing God to lead our lives. We, those of us who are gathered here this morning, are wise men and women. We come together to worship God and offer God our best. We may be kings and queens, astrologers and bankers, lawyers and doctors, teachers and builders, but when we come before God, we are followers and disciples who yearn to learn more about being faithful people. It is amazing what God can do with even the most unlikely of followers, even herdmen's who come to church to receive, but just end up wanting to worship God. God loves us all unconditionally. God can and does use each of us to further God's kingdom. Today's scripture underscores the truth that Jesus is God's revelation to the whole world, the perfect light we all still seek. And symbolized by the coming of the wise men, the men from the east who shouldn't have known or cared about this baby born as king of the Jews. All the nations come to worship Christ, and offer gifts. Gold, a gift for a king, calls us to acknowledge that Jesus is king of our lives. Frankincense, a gift for worship, urges us to think about what we are doing to grow deeper in our faith. And myrrh, the gift of sacrifice that makes us all a little uncomfortable but is what the kingdom is truly about. Like the herdmans who heard the story of Jesus' birth with fresh ears and responded, I hope that we too can hear with fresh ears and respond to the challenge of the wise men.
These wise men brought tangible gifts to Jesus. Their gifts are challenging us as a community of faith and as individuals to bring the gifts of ourselves to Jesus at the start of this new year. This morning, we will celebrate Holy Communion. We will remember the sacrifice God made for us and the grace that God extends to each one of us. Listen to the words and hear what God is offering you. What do you have to offer God? What sacrifice are you willing to make? What gift will you bring? Amen.